Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. So today's podcast guest is James Roland. Now, James runs a company with his wife, Kathy, called Cowboy Cricket Farms, where they actually raise crickets for cricket flour for basically to eat crickets. And I thought this was a fabulous, interesting, again, a little bit further out there, but I am super interested in finding out all about crickets and how they grow. And so here we go. Um, It was a fun interview. Um, It was really interesting to hear how James has grown the business, kind of their strategy behind growing the business, finding out about crickets as a crop. Um, you know, as I guess, I guess you'd call them a crop and kind of the nutritional value, the, the way they've raised them, the kind of the way they figured it out and just the different products that they offer. You know, one of their main products is a cowboy cricket, the chocolate chirp cookie. And so it's interesting hearing about that, the different aspects of what goes into processing the crickets and getting them ready for sale. And also just James's journey and his wife's journey along the way as they've built out the business. So join me in welcoming James to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, James. Well, thank you for having me. So talk to us a little bit about your farming operation. Well, um, I'm the uh, chief operations officer for Cowboy Cricket Farms, and uh, the the name tells you kind of everything. We farm crickets, so we're here in Montana trying to make a uh, insect that subtropical exists in a cold mountainous region year round. Okay, very cool. So crickets. Um, so in, in where you are, you're probably growing them inside. That's correct. All of our farms are indoors. Gotcha. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about your background. How'd you get into cricket farming? Well, my wife and I met when we were in the Coast Guard and we moved around quite a bit, but uh, we had one business that eventually failed and that forced us to move again. But we ended up in Bozeman, Montana uh, to go to school. And while going to MSU Bozeman, uh, my wife found something called the Bug Buffet, Again, exactly what it sounds like. (laughs) And uh, she went there and and people were excited. And she came back and told me, you know, people want to eat bugs. They're excited. This industry is growing. I said, no, this is an absolutely stupid idea. You're not doing this. (laughs) But as usual, she was right. I was wrong. And, uh, you know, a few years later, here we are. Okay. So how do you even learn about growing crickets? Did you reach out to other people that were doing it? Or do you travel overseas? Mostly YouTube. Okay. Uh, We did certainly reach out to people and we did find two that would help us a little bit, but they were still learning themselves. The people that actually already knew this and had been farming crickets for a while, they wouldn't talk. Mm. They wouldn't help. And so we had to do a lot of it just through trial and error. Uh, And that's actually why we have our YouTube channel now is to teach other people how to farm crickets so they don't have to take two years of trial and error and experimentation to, to do a fairly simple process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the, the type of crickets that you grow. Is there a specific type that you are growing? We raise Aketa domesticus. There's only two species that you can really raise in the U S commercially because of the regulations about transporting them around the different States. Okay. Aketa domesticus and gorilla siglitus, which is the banded cricket. So that's pretty much the only two you're going to find. Okay, yeah, because I we um, in the studio here had a cricket infestation, and for about a month or six weeks, every single podcast had crickets in the background. We could not get rid of them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we had way too many of them. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about what does a typical day look like for you? Well, the nice thing about the crickets is that they don't take a whole lot of work, really, once you get everything set up and, and uh-huh. your farm's all going. So most of my day has to do with operations for the company, making sure that you know our marketing efforts are where they need to be, although that's typically not a big thing for us either, uh, that we have our production scheduled, just all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So then you obviously have a team then that's doing the actual day-to-day care and let's say the things like harvesting and feeding and uh, shipping, that sort of thing. Yeah, there's, there's just a few of us on the whole Cowboy Crickets team. There's uh, five total. 
um, three of which are part-time. And that's all it takes for us to, to actually manage our, our farm. That's almost 5,000 square feet. So it doesn't take a whole lot of resources. Uh-huh. Um, but when we are in there to actually farm the crickets, basically you start the day off by uh, making sure you have your food and water on your little cart. And yep. then you're going to roll it through the farm, go bin by bin. They're all raised in, in little uh, wooden vats. Okay. And give them food, give them water, smell the bin, make sure it all smells like it's copacetic, and then move on. When it's time to harvest, you, you get them out into a sanitized bin, throw them in the freezer. And that's pretty much the entire process. Okay. Very cool. All right. So then uh, new crickets, because obviously you need new crickets and stuff. Um, they lay eggs, I believe. That's correct. A uh, female can lay about 11 to 14 eggs per day. So they reproduce very quickly. Okay. And then they, do they lay them in soil and then do they hatch or how does that upper part work? We use sphygnum peat moss. Okay. Uh, yep. The nice thing about it is that it absorbs the water really well. We can get an organic one, which is mm-hmm. super important because we don't want any pesticides for obvious reasons. Yeah. And then... Uh, it also comes in sterile, so we don't have any other insects that we're introducing. Once they lay the eggs, about 11 days later, they hatch into what we call pinheads, which okay. we call them that because they look like tiny little dots, like from a pin. Okay, yeah. And then at that point, what do they eat? They eat the same thing throughout their whole life cycle. We have our own feed that we developed under a grant from the USDA and the Montana Department of Commerce that has no corn, no soy, just a bunch of grains and grasses, basically. Oh, interesting. Um, Yeah. And so they eat the same thing throughout their whole life cycle. Very cool. All right. So let's continue through the grow cycle. So they said they started pinheads and then they're, they're starting to eat their food and then they molt a number of times, correct? They do. And each time they do that, it's called an instar. They have a total of seven instars. The first five, they look identical. They just get bigger each time. Gotcha. Sixth one, you can start to sex the females, because you can see their budding ovipositor. And okay. the seventh instar, the final adult instar, uh, you can easily tell the males and the females apart. The females are much larger and have a full ovipositor, which is a little stick coming off of her backside that she uses to lay the eggs in the soil. Okay. And the males are a little bit smaller than the females, and they're the ones who chirp. So if you hear a chirping cricket, you know it's a male. Okay. All right. So I had a basement full of male crickets then. (laughs) I mean, there were definitely females there somewhere. I'll guarantee you that. (laughs) Yeah. So we ended up putting out traps and we ended up, the best way was just sticky traps. We just found sticky traps, ended up to attract them. And we had literally dozens. I was shocked at how many we ended up having in our basement, but yeah, now they're all gone because it's it's cold outside. And uh, so, all right. So then harvesting, you said, um, you just put them in the freezer, you freeze them and then you, you freeze dry them, correct? We dehydrate them to process. The nice okay. thing about the freezing, though, is that's just part of their natural life cycle. So it's, it's something that would happen to them every year anyways. Is it gets cold, they go underground, and they knock out. Come springtime, it would warm yeah. up, and the younger, stronger ones would wake back up and live. The older ones would have already died off. Yeah. So uh, it's a very humane way to harvest and very cost-effective. From there, yeah. we dehydrate them for about 8 to 10 hours. We dehydrate instead of roasting. Most of our competitors roast, but dehydration allows us to keep more of that nutrition in the Mm -hmm. cricket by not using high temperatures. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so then you you dehydrate them, and then you obviously will grind them in the flour or one of the other many products that are on your website. Yep. We uh, most of them get milled into a powder. We just use a spice grinder essentially big spice grinder. Okay. And after a couple passes through that, they're a fine powder and it can be used in the cookies or Cretaceous crunchers, whatever. But we definitely sell a lot of the whole crickets as well. And really, I've been surprised at how popular those are. They're delicious. But for most yeah. people, being past the mental side of it is a lot. Well, you know, that's probably the only re- thing that's going to be preventing me from, and I probably will end up trying some at some point. But, you know, it's just that whole mental aspect of your entire life you were raised that you don't eat bugs. And now it's, yeah. So, um, but yeah, definitely need to get my kids onto them because I'm sure it's healthy for them. So let's talk about that. Talk to us about the health benefits of crickets. Well, there's some really cool benefits. Um, There's kind of two sides to it. There's the environmental side. 
and then there's a health side. On the health side, uh, you get a little bit more protein per pound compared to beef, and we're okay. in Montana, so we just kind of compare everything to beef. Yes. Um, and you get twice as much iron, which is extremely important because the World Health Organization has identified iron deficiency anemia as the number one health concern in the world, which I find just amazing. It's not yeah. water shortages, it's not disease, it's iron. And we can fix that. Yeah. And then you also get 43 times the omega-3 fatty acid content uh, so really good heart and brain health. And then mm-hmm. just a whole slurry of other micronutrients that are in there. Well, I'm sure like they've got a lot of silica because of their their shells, correct? Uh, there's silica. that Their shells are made largely out of chitin. Okay. Um, and what else? They've got a lot of like lysine, thysine, those, all those enes. Yeah. Um, my, my wife, uh, Kathy, she's the uh, CEO of the company. And she's also the one that knows all the uh, nutrition details. But gotcha. she's coached me along very well on <laughs> what they do. Yes. She's the nutrition guru. Gotcha. All right. So you said the, the health benefits, they've, they're full of uh, these nutrients. But let's talk about the environmental side of this. The environmental side is very, very exciting because, again, compared to beef, we use 2,060 times less water per pound. Okay. 14 times less feed, produce 80 times less methane, and use less than 1% of the comparable land mass. And wow. the fact is that our current agricultural practices are not sustainable. Uh-huh. We need to find new ways to raise food and feed more people with a growing population. And uh-huh. we think one of those options is insects. 80% of cultures around the world already use them. So why not us? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, because obviously I love to see integrated systems. Have you thought of integrating like crickets into any of the other systems out there? let's say growing vegetables or something like that and and high tunnels or anything like that. So as far as integrating them into one kind of ecosystem, it's possible, Mm -hmm. but uh, maybe, maybe not the most practical thing to do just because we need to manage our diseases very carefully. uh, Gotcha. Crickets are healthy. However, what we can do is after we harvest them, we take their frass, which is the cricket poop and we use that in gardens and it, it actually is a natural way for the plants to protect themselves. It signals them that they're being attacked. So in that way, we work very closely with a lot of other uh, vegetable farmers and herb farmers. Interesting. And because you're just, this feed is grains and um, grasses and stuff, they're, they're living on peat moss. So everything is probably going to be um, relatively clean to be able to be integrated right into the vegetable systems. Yeah, it's very clean. And even though our product is not certified organic yet, everything we do is up to organic standards. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. So let's talk um, about other farmers. I see you also are expanding, adding in other farmers. Talk to us a little bit about that process. It seems like the demand is outstripping the supply right now. Yeah. And that's been a big issue for us. It makes marketing sometimes redundant and other times just a poor idea because if we sell too much then i actually have upset customers Um, yeah and so until we figure out the supply side of things this market cannot grow Mm -hmm. um, at least not very quickly so what we've been doing is instead of trying to do it all ourselves which is what most people in the industry are trying to do and i totally understand that yeah uh, we were forced to bring on other farms and it's been an absolute blessing. We now have a way to spread out the risk of farming, yep. but also spread out the reward. And so we have people who are excited all over the country to farm crickets for us. We give them a guaranteed source of income, and we give them a, uh, a really good network to fall back on for information when they're having hard times and can't figure something out. Yeah, very cool. So the average person who's investing in this, they just have a building or a place to grow the crickets and then they just, do they ship you the final product or they ship you the crickets after they've been dehydrated and then you grind them? Uh, It's either frozen or dehydrated. Kind of depends on how far away they are. Mm -hmm. One thing with the dehydrated though is at that point, those crickets are food. So all of that needs to be done in a commercial kitchen and Ah. by that local health department. Uh, However, the shipping them dehydrated is a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of the cost compared to shipping them frozen. So several of our producers still go that route. 
Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. And just have the 20 seat kitchen on site, which actually isn't that much uh, work to put in place if you know what you're doing. Yeah. So. Well, and, and that's the big thing. If you know what you're doing, it took us 18 months to open the kitchen the first time. I think we could probably do it in five months now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, you know, as a farmer, there's endless tasks to be done. How do you ensure that you focus on the right things? I know you said the marketing is obviously something you don't need to focus on as much, but right now I think you're in the scaling phase, trying to bring on more farms, trying to really push that production aspect. Yeah. That's something that I've had to struggle a lot with um, as, as I start kind of giving away power within different aspects of the company. However, uh-huh. it's extremely important to have that team there, have people that you trust and find someone else to do some of the work because at the end of the day, it's just too many hours, too much work and you lose sight. Uh, so really our, the whole way we've done that is just building a good team uh-huh. and, and the five of us each have our tasks, and, yep. but we're all cross trained. And so if we need to, uh, our graphic designer can come in and make cookies and yeah. he can also do farming. You know, neither of those are his tasks, but he know, definitely knows how to do them. Yeah. And the thing with the crickets is it's not like it's a very complicated system, like let's say like grafting tomatoes or something, which can be quite technical. Sounds to me like there's, it's basic principles that have to be followed, but it's not, you know, incredibly complicated. Yeah, it's not horribly complicated. We teach a uh, five-day course on how okay. to do it. And by the end of that, you should know everything there is about farming crickets. And I mean, it, it's just not that difficult. The biggest thing is sometimes people try to change the, the settings and humidity and, uh, and experimentation is great, but not when you're trying to do something on a commercial scale. Yes, gotcha. You do not want to screw it all up at that scale. So. No. So let's talk a little bit about your mentors. I mean, obviously you said you reached out to a few different farms, but who would you say have been your mentors um, as, as long your journey? Business mentors, talk to us about that. Absolutely. Uh, one of our largest ones, although not in business, has been Dr. Florence Dunkel. She's the entomologist that created the bug buffet. Uh, she's helped us tremendously with a lot of our research and resources along the insects. Uh, from the state, of Montana. We have had tremendous, tremendous support, especially from Angie Nelson, who was with the Department of Ag. She just moved over to another department recently. But the whole state, really, all the agencies, we've been amazed at how supportive they've been. Very cool. And on the business side, uh, our SCORE mentor, Rick, um, really helped kind of keep me on track and and make sure that Kathy knows you know, hey, here's here's where where you should be taking the company, and, and he's made a huge impact as well. Yeah, score is um, awesome. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Because that's all across the country, and that's a resource that anyone can reach out to. Correct? Yes, absolutely, and it's free. Yeah, I, I thought it was some kind of a, I don't know, not not a joke, almost like a scam when I first <laughs> heard about it, because. You, there's so many places out there that, you know, they'll easily do business consulting with you for $250 an hour. Yeah. And here's this place saying, Hey, we have all these retired executives that, you know, want to sit down, review the nitty gritty of your business plan and go over marketing and do everything. And they're never going to charge a dime. In fact, every now and then they'll just buy you coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the exact opposite. Right. Yeah. But the fact is, that's what it is. Um, you know, it's, it's retired executives uh, from all over all kinds of different fields. And so, you know, different people know different things. And uh, it's been amazing. And we're very, very fortunate to be one of the uh, top businesses for SCORE uh, last year. So one of the top 100 businesses and even went on to win the Veteran Entrepreneur of the Year Award with them. Uh, very cool. So, you know, SCORE has been a tremendous, tremendous outreach program for us. And I think anyone that's going into business should find their local SCORE mentor and reach out. Very cool. If there was, let's say, a magic reset button as it relates to starting your farm, what systems would you go back and put into place sooner rather than later? I think that the biggest change we would make is trying to find more education. I'm sure there was someone out there that would have helped us. Mm. Just putting that in, making sure that that we knew what what was going on would have saved us a year and a half and mm. tens of thousands of dollars of struggle. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that existed, so it might not even be possible, but that's the biggest thing. We, we just spent so much time and money 
doing it the wrong way and learned a lot from it. Putting that in play would have been, would have been nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And with that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with James Rowland from Cowboy Crickets in Bozeman, Montana. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. We are back with James from Cowboy Crickets in Bozeman, Montana. James, talk to us a little bit more about the team. How do you divide roles? We have five well-divided roles. Uh, Kathy is the CEO. And so most importantly, what she does is really provides us a, uh, an intent, right? So in mm-hmm. the Army, we call it commander's intent. They'll, they'll send down uh, what they want done. Not necessarily mm-hmm. how to do it, just just where our end goal is, where mission complete is. And so then my job is to take that information and actually execute on it. Mm -hmm. So I work with our graphic designer, Cree, um, our farm manager, Kyrie, and uh, Sarah, she comes in and helps with a lot of the uh, cleaning. Okay. And when each of us are doing our tasks, that means that we, we shouldn't really have to be going too far outside of our left and right boundaries. Uh Um, and, and we can focus in on that. But since we do have such a small team, everyone's cross-trained on everything else. Um, anyone can go in there and make cookies. Anyone can farm. Not everyone can do the graphic design. We've proven that one, but we've tried. <laughs> I, I'm horrible at that stuff. I don't make pretty things. And so everyone should be able to do the basic day-to-day operations of the company, even if yeah. they do other specialties. Gotcha. Very cool. So how did you find those great team members? Uh, sheer luck and numbers. Okay. We, we've gone through a lot of people who are not with the company anymore because they, you know, they just weren't a good fit for whatever reason. Uh-huh. Um, and when we did find uh, someone that, that would actually work, we grabbed onto them and, and shackled them to the floor and said, you're, you're staying here as long as possible. Uh-huh. And that's really been, been the key is retaining that talent. Uh, uh-huh. If we can find people and motivate them and have similar goals, then that's more important than the salary. That's more important than anything else, really. Uh, Mm -hmm. We treat people well and we align our goals. Yeah. And it sounds like with your farming operation, you know your numbers really well, so you know exactly how much you can afford to pay people. Yes. Having good information, good intel on what we're doing is huge. So I've got spreadsheet after spreadsheet breaking down all the costs of everything and growth expectations. And and we, we know you know, yeah, we know what we can pay people. And Bozeman is a very competitive job market right now Mm -hmm. uh, for employers, not for employees. So it can be very tough for us to actually find people. But, you know, that's where that motivation comes in. If if they're just looking for a paycheck, we're probably not the best place. But if Mm -hmm. they really believe in what we're doing, then it'll all work out. Mm -hmm. All right. So break that down for a minute. What do they need to believe to be a good fit? Well, first off, they need to, you know, really see that we need to make these changes in agriculture. Uh-huh. And if, you know, if it's someone that thinks that we're going to be able to feed our growing population for the next 50 years, how we're doing things right now, they're, they're just not going to understand it. Uh-huh. Um, they need to be able to deal with uh, our perhaps somewhat uh, ingratuitous humor at times. Okay. Um, because uh, you know, I'm I'm not changing it. We made a company so that we have a a place to be. Um, and while I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable, that's just kind of how we run it. Uh-huh. Um, and I think most importantly, they really have to think that this 
weird idea of feeding people bugs has some some merit to it. Um, and, you know, if you can find someone that will deal with the humor, likes bugs, and actually wants to see changes in our agricultural system, mm-hmm. man, they're, they're probably going to be just fine. They also have to show up to work. That's a big one. Yes, yes, that is a big one. So let's talk about your marketing. You said you really haven't had to do much of it. Obviously, you do have a nice website. You do have good packaging. But um, it sounds like people are just finding you. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, because of Cree, our, our graphic designer, uh, he's taken the packaging that I had designed, which was horrible, and made it something uh, that people actually want to buy. So uh-huh. that's been a huge part of it. And, and we've been setting up all these uh, little base stones, making sure we can build a bigger structure on it. Uh-huh. But at the end of the day, we can't really market right now because at any time, I only have a couple hundred items on hand. I yeah. mean, they go out the door just as fast, if not faster than we can make them. I am sold out of a couple things right now um, that we, we just can't make enough of. Yeah. So our biggest way of marketing so far has been education and sampling. We want to make sure that the people that do buy our product know why they're doing it, really mm-hmm. believe in the product, and can evangelize it to their friends and family. Uh, Mm -hmm. We have to go slow right now because of our supplies. So we cannot buy ads. We can't do any of that. Um, But what we can do is we can create a small, extremely devoted following for our product and for our company. And then when we're able to, when we have the supply, we'll be able to grow way quicker than we ever could have. All right. So what I'm hearing you saying is you're creating a, a base of raving fans that when you need to start to scale, you're just going to evangelize them and they will help you scale very quickly. That's true. That's correct. Because they, they actually believe in what we're doing already. We don't mm-hmm. have to sell them on the product at all. They understand it. Um, and they're a way better sales force than I could ever be. So then you're really not spending a lot of time and effort in promotion. You're just focusing on the people you're they're already buying your product, just educating them, um, talking to them about your mission, talking to them about the benefits of what they're doing, and just providing a superior product so that they are 100% happy with it. That's correct. Although I do have to add one thing that we've done, and that is the product line itself is kind of an advertisement. Uh, what we found is if you give someone a whole roasted cricket, they probably won't eat it. If you give them the powder, they don't really know what to do with it. But if you give them a delicious chocolate tr- cookie, it all uh, makes sense. And so gotcha. we call crickets the gateway bug because it kind of gets you in for the, the tougher stuff later. Um, <laughs> try, try feeding Americans a tarantula or a cockroach. Yes. Yes. Know, yes. If they start with a cricket cookie, which just looks like and tastes like a chocolate chip cookie, then suddenly people understand, wow, okay, this is a food source. I feel good. This is good nutrition for me. It didn't hurt. Maybe I'll try the whole crickets. And and then from there, we have a good customer. And gotcha. really believes in what we're doing. And they're part of our family. We we talk with some of these, these super fans, I mean, daily about the product and, and what they would like to see. And we take that feedback and we develop new products out of what they tell us to do. Gotcha. Because I see now that you've got the smoky jumpers, the cinnamon ones, the original, the wasabi. So you're really starting to expand that product line as, as you get that feedback. Yep. And we have another half dozen products coming out in 2020. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So let's talk about new farmers because um, that's something we work with a lot. What do you see the biggest mistake new farmers making? Are you talking about farmers for cricket farming or just uh, both in general. I, obviously, you're working with new ones, and you mentioned earlier that you see them trying to change the parameters before they really know what they're doing. But expand on that a little bit. Sure. So, in agriculture in general, I, I think one of the issues that I see is farmers do whatever they've known for a long period of time, and and this isn't just farmers. This is you know everyone, mm-hmm. right? You find something, you know how to do it, and you kind of stick with it. But agriculture is doing something that it hasn't done in a long time, and that's changing. Mm-hmm. And so the farmers, not just in cricket farming that we've seen that have been the most successful, are those that are willing to adapt constantly to new technology and new opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of our farmers coming on board for cricket farming actually are doing just that. They're coming over from other types of agriculture, and they say, look, I raised chickens for 
you know, 60 years, I've got these giant, giant chicken buildings. They aren't paying enough, but I still have the buildings. Can I mm-hmm. raise crickets in them? It's like, heck yeah, you can. So we make sure that they have the education because the biggest mistake we see with cricket farming is they simply don't know what to do because the yeah. information is hard to find. Um, we're trying to fix that, but still it's, it's hard to find. And if you don't know what to do, you have to guess. Gotcha. So talk to me a little bit about the YouTube channel. Is there a, how do they find that YouTube channel? Sure. You can go right on youtube.com uh, slash cowboy crickets. we just do a search for cowboy crickets. You'll find us. Um, Very cool. And we, uh, we kind of have two different things we do with the channel. One is teach people about farming crickets, how to farm crickets, why, uh, a lot of the motivations as well as how to do all the processing and everything that we do in our uh-huh. company, you can repeat just by watching our YouTube channel. The other thing that we do there is just take you kind of behind the scenes in our life and the company itself. Uh, make sure that if you're someone that wants to know about Cowboy Cricket Farms, then you know everything about it. We are an extremely transparent company. So you can watch some of our family vacations, escapades, all kinds of stuff on there as we uh, try to make a go at this whole cricket farming thing. Mm, very cool. So talk to us about the beginning. You know, you said at the beginning you'd made a lot of mistakes. When did you know that you'd actually made it, that this was a viable business, that you could take this to the next level? Yeah, I think we're still learning that every day to some extent. Uh, but the, the big change probably came this last summer, uh, so just a few months ago, when uh, we, we just could not keep up on product. Even though we had seven farms onboarding mm. or already sending us product, um, no matter what we did, we just kept selling out every couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it kind of hit us like, wow, if we can, if we can scale this thing, um, there's, there's demand. And mm-hmm. people really do want to know this. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. All right, if you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Favorite farming tool? Uh, you know, I love those uh, those balers that go down and uh, uh, go across the, the wheat fields. Okay. We have, uh, just right outside my, my front door, actually, I can see these giant wheat fields. And they've got, I don't even know what these things are called, harvesters maybe. But they just go along and just like eat up all the stuff and then poop out the little uh, bales right behind them. Those things are yeah. amazing to watch. Okay. All right. Yes. I, I get the uh, attraction to watch that big machinery. That's half the reason I got into farming. And actually this fall, I, uh, I got to take my daughter to sit in one of the uh, combines, one of the great big uh, combines harvesting beans this, this fall. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I claim that she had asked me about going and sitting in it, but it may have been the other way around that I was using her as an excuse to go ride in it myself. But uh, she ended up having a good two hours in the combine and didn't want to stop. So I think Uh, we both benefited. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, you can go to cowboycrickets.com, search for Cowboy Crickets on Google, and you'll find all kinds of articles about us. And then all the social media platforms at Cowboy Crickets. Uh, So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. I'm sure I'm missing something there. We, We try to make ourselves as easy to find as possible. But if you're going to be in the Bozeman, Montana area, uh, February 2020 or later, uh, you can come by our brand new facility that we're opening and you can actually come in and do a self-guided tour through our insectarium, learning about what eats bugs, who eats bugs, uh, what kind of bugs we eat, big educational interactive exhibits. And then you can take a tour through the actual cricket farm, see how the whole operation works. Uh, it's an amazing time. We've had thousands of people go through our old facility and we can't wait to open up the new one. Very cool. So that, yeah, I will definitely make sure that that is on my 2020 list of places to visit because um, that sounds like a ton of fun. And uh, again, great for the kids to bring them through and teach them about how the, everything works with um, eating bugs. So again, um, and if you do want, you can go to our website, Thriving Farmer podcast.com and uh, check out the show notes. We'll link to all your social media there as well if people want. And we do now have a feature that you can search the podcast audio by keyword on our website as well. So just go to the website top and uh, banner there and it's just search podcast and you can just search for anything. So if you want to know where we talked about um, 
let's see. What was one of the fun things we talked about during this episode, James? Uh, maybe the growth cycle of crickets. Yes. So if you were like to type in, what did you say that word was the different growth stages they go through? They're called instars. Instars. So yeah, if you want to type in the word instars, that will pull you right to the area in the podcast where we discussed that. So um, James, thanks so much for coming on today. Really appreciate this. It's been a fascinating conversation and I know our audience is going to love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.